Good evening. I want to welcome each of you back to the service this evening. I hope you had a good day. It's been a beautiful day, and I think we're just getting that much closer to spring. Uh, Cindy reminded me before service next Saturday night before you go to bed, you want to make sure to change your clocks. Uh, so we spring ahead next Saturday night. So uh, anyway, uh, I don't know why we still do that, but we do it. So just, just keep that in mind. Uh, Porter ladies will be meeting this Tuesday evening at 630. Uh, Lori will be bringing the lesson entitled uh, God Honors Biblical Child Training as part of their My God Who Hears series. So uh, just for our ladies, make sure that you set that time aside and come out and support the gathering and enjoy the fellowship. There will be no Masters men this, this Saturday. Uh, Terry texted me today and let me know uh, that there will be no meeting this, this Saturday. So, And again, next Sunday we'll have Alejandro Johnson uh, with us in the evening service, newly appointed, he and his wife Brianna. I believe she's from Muscle Shoals, Alabama, but uh, they've just been newly appointed to not uh, to go where Kathy Crawford served for so many years. So uh, look forward to that service. As we open this evening in prayer, uh, let's be mindful of those who would love to be here and can't. And maybe we have some traveling, I'm not sure, but I know we've got some that are a little under the weather. So let's lift them up in prayer as well. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then Dave's going to come and lead us in our singing. Our Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your grace. And Father, we thank you that when we fail you and we fall short, that your grace fills that void. And we just trust you uh, to meet our needs tonight as we've gathered to worship. We pray that uh, the worship would be pleasing to you and honor you. And Father, that our hearts would be in tune with your spirit as we gather around your word. Have your way in our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hymn number 697, just over in the glory land. 697, we'll sing the first, second, and last verses. to number 288 he touched me 288 
prayer request would you all like to share this evening? Four hundred twenty four have faith in God. Four twenty four will stand, sing the first, second, and last verse. Stand, please. Have faith in God when your pathway is lonely. He sees and knows all the way you have trod. Have faith in God. 
something that we might want to make a matter of our prayers daily is the discipleship that's going on within our church. I don't know if anyone else noticed, but this morning Shevin was sitting up here with Jason and Paul had Danny back there and these, these men and others are taking these young boys under their wing, so to speak, and, and they're maturing, uh, they're growing up and uh, they're actually participating now in the worship and uh, just pray that uh, the Lord would continue to uh, place people like Paul and, and Shevin in their lives, uh, down through the week even, uh, that uh, can encourage them in their walk with Christ. And as I stood up here and we were singing, waiting to pray, uh, I know Susie don't realize what's going on. She probably feels like a couple of, like she's a monkey tamer back here. Uh, if you see how these kids behave sometimes during church, but that's discipleship. Uh, these two girls, they can't read a word yet, but Susie turned to their, the hymn book to the right page for them because I think they might be able to tell numbers a little bit, but they're learning how to, how to worship. They're learning how to grow up in church and worship and participate, and that excites me, not just because they're my grandkids, but it just excites me. And so many others of you that have sat with during church or spent a day with during the week, and you're discipling them. And, uh, you know, that's an incredible thing because one day, who knows uh, where they'll be and what they'll be doing for the kingdom. But, and it's happened in this church down through the years, uh, raising up young people that know what worship is like and, and how to participate in that even at a young age. So uh, I want to thank all of you for your efforts in, in, in the discipleship process here at Porter. Noah, can I get you and, and your papaw to... Help us with the offering tonight. And I want to brag on my grandson a little bit. He took his Bible with him into Toro Loco and was sitting reading before the food came and after, the, after he finished his scallops. He's got a very, very um, distinct palate, so he can eat about anything. But it, it excites me to see them excited about reading God's Word. So. Randy, would you ask a blessing on the offering, please? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this uh, beautiful day today that you've given us to be able to come here today and praise your name and to lift each other up and just hear the word of the Lord and what we learn from the word and be able to use that word and bring someone to you. We ask now to be with us as we give back to you what you've given to us and pray we'll be pleasing you out of Jesus' name. We praise your name today.
This evening we'll be in 1 Samuel 17. 1 Samuel 17, we'll begin here in verse 17 uh, shortly. A number of years ago, uh, two young men were having their mid-morning uh, refreshment break at, the, at a soda fountain. That tells you how long ago it was. One paid for the drinks with a dollar bill and received 20 cents change, which he immediately uh, dropped into his pocket. A minute later, the clerk put two dimes on the counter saying, I believe you forgot your change. And the young man who had been treated started to speak, but his friend stopped him with a knowing wink and put the two dimes in his pocket. His partner, however, couldn't forget the incident. Twenty cents isn't much money, he reasoned, but it's the principle of the thing. Well, years passed, and these two men, now mature, found themselves working for the same company in a big city. The one who had been treated was the executive vice president in charge of personnel, and the one who had received his change twice was in middle management. The time came when the company was ready to open another office and a factory in another city, and the choice for a general manager lay between the man who had wrongfully taken the two dimes and another employee. It was the responsibility of the executive vice president to make the choice. His mind went back to that soda fountain incident, and he reasoned like this. If for no reason... My friend would steal 20 cents from a drugstore. What would he do if he were placed in a position of trust with thousands of dollars of the company's money in his hands? The other man got the job. Having lost a minor temptation in the battle with dishonesty, the vice president's friend didn't even get a chance at the promotion. He didn't get a chance to fight the major battle. And the point is that our battles prepare us for the great encounters that most certainly are going to come in our lives. And when we read of David's victory uh, over Goliath, his slaughter literally of Goliath, I think we're quick to forget that he had won some lesser battles before he ever faced Goliath. He had trusted God for help and strength in the smaller battles, when he came to this supreme test, he already knew how to trust God. So I want us to look at some of the battles that David had won before he took Goliath's head, uh, because we fight similar battles every day. So we're going to read, begin there in verse 17, and we're going to read down through verse 54. So um, I like the way that Paul said it yesterday when he was speaking. He said the front porch is bigger than the the house, and it probably will take us longer to set the stage than actually to share what I have to share with you. But We read, And Jesse said unto David his son, Take now for thy brethren an ephah of this parched corn and these ten loaves, and run to the camp of thy brethren, and carry these ten cheeses unto the captain of their household, of their thousand, and look how thy brethren fare, and take their pledge." Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah, fighting with the Philistines. And David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with the keeper, and took and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the trench as the host was going forth to the fight and shouted for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, army against army. And David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage and ran into the army and came and saluted his brethren. And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines and spake according to the same words. And David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man that has come up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up. And it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king, will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth with this Philistine and taketh away 
the reproach from Israel. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him after this manner, saying, So shall it be done to the man that killeth him. And Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, Why camest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride, and the haughtiness, and the naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down, that thou mightest see the battle. And David said, What have I now done? Is there not a cause? And he turned from him toward another, and spake after the same manner. And the people answered him again after the former manner. And when the words were heard which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, let no, more, no, let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And David, Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, or but a boy, and he a man of war from his youth. And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him, and smote him, and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard, and smote him, and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion, and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. Saul armed David with his armor, and he put an helmet of brass upon his head, and he armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go, for he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off him. And he took his staff in his hand, and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook, and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had, even in a, scri even in a scrip. And his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. And the Philistine came on and drew near unto David, and the man that bare the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy and of a fair countenance. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog, that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beast of the field. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword, and with a spear, and with a shield. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee, and take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcass, carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day into the fowls of the air, and to the wild beasts of the earth, and all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel." And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. And it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead. And the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him, but there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. And the men of Israel and of Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines until thou come to the valley and to the gates of Ekron. And the wounded of the Philistines fell down by the way of uh, Shearim, even unto Gath, and unto Ekron. And the children of Israel returned from chasing after the Philistines, and they spoiled their tents. In other words, they took all the loot and the bounty that they got, and they put it in their tents. And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem, but he put his armor in his tent. Before we move on, I just want to say that this is a message I've dreaded preaching all day. I prayerfully asked the Lord to give me something else, and he didn't. It's a message I've been preparing for nearly a month. And as I preach it tonight, I really feel unworthy to for reasons that you'll soon understand. But 
the first thing that we see is that David had won the battle with temper. No one probably could get under that boy's skin like his big brother. And Eliab, David's oldest brother, was jealous after seeing what David was doing and what he suspected he was there to do. And he worked over his little brother pretty good. And uh, he said, why have you come down? And basically, he minimalized David's worth. He said, why did you leave those few sheep that you tend to? Um, he minimalized David's uh, occupation or, or what he did. And as we look at this, this isn't just another exciting, romantic tale, uh, even though it has all the elements of one and that the hero is a reward for his heroism uh, of slaying the giant wins the hand of the king's daughter. I mean, that's the, the reward. But in the plot of such a story, what would be uh, Eliab's part? I see Eliab as the ugly elder stepsister in, in Cinderella. Um, Eliab was embarrassed. He was jealous. He was resentful. If his tongue had been a javelin and directed at Goliath instead of his brother, he could have probably killed him himself at 100 yards. But David controlled his temper, even though his big brother was really letting him have it. He didn't reply in kind. He had bigger fish to fry than to waste time and energy fighting with his big brother. Nothing, I don't think there's anything that can disturb the accuracy of the eye or the steadiness of the hand like the passion of an uncontrolled temper. If David would have went into that battle angry with his temper seething, would he have been able to have fulfilled the task at hand? But David won this lesser battle with temper before he ever took on the giant. And that's something that we all have to do, and I'm going to circle back to this one at the close of the message. But then David had also won the battle with fear. When David expressed his, literally, his righteous indignation, his disgust and his anger at Goliath's insulting challenges in verse 26, he meant it. He was indignant because he felt that God's honor had been dragged through the dirt. His words, repeated to several, was that he was not afraid at all to face Goliath. He wasn't afraid of fighting this giant. And his claim eventually reached the ear of King Saul, who sent for him. And Saul was amazed when he saw the one that had been talking so much. He might have expected someone that was at least a little comparable to the champion of the Philistines, but it wasn't. I mean... Scripture defines him as ruddy, um, of a fair countenance. David was probably not a fully developed adolescent quite yet. He was a, a boy, it says here. He was a young man. Um, still a youth, but it was David who took the initiative he said, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. As David saw it, something had to be done. Something had to be done to remove this, this reproach, this insult to God's people. And when he didn't see anyone else lining up, he said, I'll do it. I'll go. I'll fight him. There was no panic on David's part. It doesn't seem that there was the slightest bit of anxiety on David's part. He wasn't afraid. He was going as God's representative to defend God's honor. Fear has really been considered a wasteful and harmful emotion. The energy that we put into fear and anxiety is really wasted. It drains us of more Productive emotions, fear disarms us, makes us easy prey before our enemies. Fear paralyzes us and keeps us from doing what we know we ought to do. 
And if we can conquer fear in the, in the smaller battles, uh, it helps us when we face the giants, the big ones, in a way where, where we're unafraid. Thirdly, David had won the battle with unbelief. Saul was really amazed with David's courage, but he still wasn't willing to let David go into this kind of a fight at a disadvantage. But David recounted some of his experiences, really in the rich history of God's uh, watch care over him. If you look at verses 34 through 37, David had already experienced and known the power of God when he faced the lion and the bear. And uh, now his faith that God would give the victory again, he was sure of that. He said, God, help me against these wild beasts, and he'll help me against the enemy of his people. Something we need to understand, I think, and recognize is faith is not something that sprouts up uh, full-grown in the night. It doesn't happen. I mean, it's not like toadstools that seem to pop up in your yard or dandelions as soon as you've mowed the grass. It's something that doesn't just pop up. It grows, and it grows through exercising it and practicing it and it has to be cultivated. And even though David was still a boy, a youth, his faith seemed to be mature. It seemed to be full grown. So David, this wasn't really a contest or a battle between himself and Goliath, but between God and Goliath. Uh, he said he has defied the armies of the living God. And for David, this contest had, had really significant religious implications. And and going as God's servant, it never occurred to him that he could lose. He went into this knowing that he was going to receive the victory. And his speech to the Goliath, it was, that was something. As you look at verses 45 through 47, uh, that's, that's quite a speech, but it was more than just big talk. David was preaching the power of faith in God to everyone that was listening. And this was the actual basis of the contest, and no doubt the reason why it's preserved in such great detail throughout Scripture. We need faith. We need faith, not in programs, not in slogans, not in material things, but we need faith in God. And until we can win the battle with unbelief, we're not ready to fight any giants. And then David had won the battle with pride. Saul finally agreed to let David go. But he couldn't believe that David, even with God's help, was going to be able to kill a giant with such crude weapons. But we see here that Saul's equipment wasn't the answer. It only takes a little imagination to see how amusing and maybe even absurd this picture must have been. We read that, that Saul stood head and shoulders above other men. And here's David, a young boy. Imagine that coat of mail bumping his knees, maybe bruising his shin bones, and that brass helmet down over his eyes. But there's something deadly and dangerous in it as well, and that's the temptation of pride. I mean, this was the king's armor. David could have said, hey, big brother, hey, Eliab, look at me now. What do you think now that I'm wearing Saul's armor? But that wasn't David. He wasn't tempted to wear the, seems poorly fitting armor at all. He said, I can't go in these. I haven't proved them. They're not worthy. So he took off the armor, and God doesn't wage war as, as we do. He has his own methods his own weapons, his own way, and his own time. We have to humble ourselves to fight his way. Pride's deadly. It's self-destructive. It's deceptive. It, it can and will defeat us. It says that pride comes before the fall. And pride is to trust in self, which is the exact opposite of trusting in God. And until we can win the battle with pride, we're not ready to fight any giants. So as we look at these four areas of 
David's life that he had gained victory, does his story of his life sound familiar at all? So I was looking at these, I thought, you know, I don't think, I don't feel that I battle too much with pride, fear, or unbelief, at least I hope I don't. But I do occasionally struggle with temper. This is a battle that I have to continually place in God's hands. If I'm ever going to overcome the problem, I'm going to have to put it in God's hands, and I had to do that today. And... uh I already told Dave that, you know, I I really don't want an invitation at the end of this. I just want us to close in prayer because uh, I want to apologize to the board and specifically to Dina. I misread something in our meeting this morning at the end, and I I lashed out. I was wrong. I didn't respond in a way that honored Christ, and I'm sorry for that. Um, It's humbling. I responded in a way that I believe could grieve the Spirit in a way that hurt Dina. And I apologize to Dina privately after church, and I ask her forgiveness, and I do so again, uh, openly. My sinful attitude this morning was expressed openly in front of the board, and I confess my sin here openly before you. Uh, Dina, I'm sorry. I preached last week that the devil is not happy with what God has been doing in our midst. And if I allow it, he'll even use me as the pastor of this church to cause disharmony and dissension in our midst. I recognize that today, and I repented of it. And I ask each of you to forgive me for allowing the devil to get a stronghold in my attitude and in my response, and pray that you would pray with me that I would gain victory over this area in my life, and that the fruit of the Spirit would be more evident in my life. The battle's real. I would have given anything to have preached anything else tonight. This has been on my schedule to preach for a month. And the first issue in the message was temper. God has a way of humbling us. So again, I ask that each of you forgive it, to forgive me for allowing that to become an issue. But does temper and fear and unbelief and pride hinder our trust in God? You bet. You bet. It's my prayer that God would help each of us, beginning with me and our struggle with these enemies, that would be prepared for the greater encounters that are going to come. Because we're going to have some giants to face in our lives before we get out of this world. And we have to prove ourselves in the smaller things if we're going to win in the bigger ones. I'd like for you to pray with me as we close. Uh, We're not going to take time for any other announcements. I think we've announced everything that needs announced. But we're just going to close in prayer and uh, ask God to continue to do what he's been doing and to help us to keep ourselves out of the way while he does. Our Father, you know our heart. And Lord, I thank you for grace. I thank you for your forgiveness. I thank you for your Holy Spirit that chastises us uh, when we don't represent you well. And Lord, I pray that, like David, that each of us would be found faithful in these areas of our lives. Father, as we deal with our emotions, and Father, as we deal with doubt, and fear. Father, as we deal with pride and everything else, Father, I just pray that you would help us to rely on the leadership of the Holy Spirit, that we might truly follow Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, that we wouldn't trust our our own thoughts, our own emotions, but Father, that we would rely fully and trust fully in you. Again, you know, we seek your forgiveness for our shortcomings and help us to stand stronger tomorrow than we have today. Father, help us like David when the big issues in life come that we might be ready for those to to claim victory in them through your leadership and your guidance.
because of being faithful in the smaller things. Lord, just help us to represent you well. I pray that you'd have your way in our hearts down through this week, that you would help us to be sensitive to what's going on around us, that we might represent you well as we share the gospel, as we deal with life in a way that others may see the hope that we have in you. And Lord, help us just to, to serve you well. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Y'all are dismissed.